Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew and chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Hallelujah. We give God all the praise. We give him all the glory. There's no God like our God. Matthew 16, verse 13 to verse 19. Let's rise up for the reading of God's holy word. Matthew 16, verse 13 to verse 19. Have begin after the reading of God's holy word. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus asked the disciple who they thought that he was. After they had so eloquently told him who everybody else thought that he was. It's interesting how we can be so confident about various other schools of thought, about what other people think. They are saying this, they are saying that. It's interesting how we are quick to say people are saying but we are not quick to say, I am saying. And a lot of the time, we use the people are saying thing just to cover up what we are thinking and saying ourselves. So Jesus goes the step further and says, who do you say? Stop telling me what somebody else is saying. Tell me what you say. And their silence was deafening. I know the value of all these anonymous stuff, um, surveys and things we do, and I was still engage in anonymous surveys, but I really like the person that's really ready to put their name behind the stance. Simon Peter stood up. He said, well, I'm going to give it a shot. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> Why did Jesus even ask this question? Because Jesus understood that their accurate perception of him would impact their accurate perception of themselves. Because if you don't see him right, you won't see yourself right. But if you see him right, then you'll be able to see yourself right. Only Simon had an accurate re revelation of who Jesus was. Jesus was so excited about Simon's response that he said, you will no longer be Simon, now you will be known as Peter. Simon means a reed that is easily tossed to and fro by the wind, while Peter means a stone, a small rock that is not easily moved by the wind. Simon did not have an accurate revelation of himself and his purpose until he gave, got an accurate revelation of who Christ was. Listen, it is in the light of the revelation of God that the new and true you is revealed. To discover the new you, you have to first of all discover God. And it is in the light of the discovery of God that you discover the new you. So the simple subject of my teaching this Sunday morning is Simon or Peter, who are you? Help me ask your neighbor, Simon or Peter, who are you? Father, I ask that you help me this Sunday morning, that you speak through me, that you cause my tongue to be as the pen of the red writer, that I might inscribe upon the hearts of the men and women that are listening to me virtually and in person, your living word. And those that will even watch this later, cause there to be great emancipation in Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And the people said aloud, amen. amen. And as you take your seat, whisper once again, Simon or Peter, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? I'm watching the clock. 
Your perception is powerful indeed. Your perception determines your reception. Matthew chapter 10 verse 41 says, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So what determines what you receive is not who the man is, but how you perceive, therefore receive the man. So I might be a prophet, but if you do not see me as a prophet, you will not receive anything from me that is prophetic. So it's very important that we are very deliberate about our perception, our view, our perspective of people that God sends into our lives because they might be carrying something, but your perception could be stopping you from receiving what it is that they are carrying. There is nowhere where this particular principle is as critical as in our perception of God. You see, because if you have an inaccurate perception of God, then you will always receive inaccurate things from God. If you have an accurate perception of God, then you are able to receive accurate things from God. The God that you perceive is the God that you receive. So we've got to get our perception of God right. And this was what the subject of my thought was last week Sunday, to start to sort out how we see God. Uh, There's been huge misrepresentations of who God is and God's disposition towards us. And that has impacted our perception and therefore our reception. It has greatly impacted our faith, even our ability to believe God for stuff. Because if you see God as this tyrannical judge that is looking for every excuse to punish and to main men and women all over the world, you will not have faith to receive from him. But if you are able to get the accurate perception of God as the God that forgives your sins, that redeems you from destruction, the God that has executed judgment that was meant for you upon Christ Jesus on the cross, and therefore is now able to, with great largesse, uh, squander mercy and grace towards you, of course that's going to liberate your faith to receive from God everything that he has promised. Can I prophesy over somebody's life even this Sunday morning? morning, that even as your mind is getting renewed, even as your perception of God is becoming more accurate than it has ever been, there is going to be a supernatural turnaround in your life. Your faith is going to go to a totally new and higher level in the mighty name of Jesus. I decree and declare that even before the close of this year, may you have a testimony of the goodness of our God in the mighty name of Jesus. And the people shouted aloud, amen. Amen Amen and amen. Hallelujah. And we've come to learn and understand Paul Paul's prayers, when you study the New Testament, you start to see more and more clearly uh, the subject of a whole lot of Paul's prayers for the church. We find that the majority of Paul's prayer for the church was not prayers to do, but prayers to know. In fact, as I looked closely at Paul's prayers, I found out that a whole lot of his prayers were either thanksgiving or requests to know stuff. There weren't too many of his prayers that was about doing stuff because he knew that the truth that you discover, that you know, is the truth that will make you free. That the greatest problem in the believer's life is not all about what he's doing or not doing, but really about what he knows or does not know. For my people are destroyed, not because demons and devils are so powerful, but but because of their lack of knowledge. Your knowledge informs what you do, not the other way around. Is anybody hearing me this Sunday morning? So he prays that we would know. And one of the most powerful prayers of Paul, we read about in the book of Ephesians and chapter 1 from verse 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of of, of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of who? In the knowledge of God. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know the hope of his calling 
fallen? And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? These are things that Paul is praying that we will know. He says in verse 18, the latter part, he says that you might know the hope of your calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. There is an inheritance of God inside you. God has something that he has deposited inside you. You have great unrealized potential on the inside of you. Next week Sunday, I'm going to preach and teach on unlocking your potential, opening new vestas of possibility in your life. You don't want to miss next week Sunday. Hallelujah. He's praying that the church would know. And the first discovery that he considers to be critical for the church to know is to discover God, that you might be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, in the knowledge of God. He wants you to know God. I can't overemphasize this, that we must seek to know God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, but then he goes further and says, after you have discovered God, there's a next thing that I need you to discover. He says that you might know the hope of your calling. Whew. Counterintuitively, the discovery of self does not really start with the pursuit of self-realization, but rather in the pursuit of God-realization. Where people are trying to find themselves, trying to uh, self-actualize and self-define and self-determine who they really are, that's not where to start. Where it really is meant to start is with the pursuit of God, to be a God chaser. Do I have any God chasers under the sound of my voice? If you are a God chaser under the sound of my voice, come on, shout, yes, I'm a God chaser. I will chase him. Early will I seek after him. At noontime, I will pursue his face. Even in the midnight hour, it is his face that I will seek. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Self-discovery does not start with self-discovery. Self-discovery starts with God-discovery. Therefore, the pursuit of the knowledge of God should be your prime pursuit. It is in the light of the discovery of God that you actually discover yourself. In other words, find God and you will find you. Uh, it, and another way to put it is that if you really want to find yourself, you need to get lost in God. Help me tell your neighbor, if you really want to find yourself, you've got to get lost in God. Oh, yes. Uh, the book of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39 says, He who finds his life uh, will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake, it is that person that will find it. So again, it seems to contradict that th to find myself, I've got to lose myself. Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 and 26 says, For whosoever desires to save his life, to keep his life, it's that person that's going to lose his life. But whoever loses his life, gives up his life for my sake, it's that person that will actually find his life. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? To find yourself, you've got to find God. You've got to lose it to find it. You've got to give it away in order to own it. What you can't give, you don't own. So get lost in God and you will find yourself. And this we see in our text, that it was when Simon found out who God was when he said that, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, that he was now able to find out who he was, that he was no longer Simon, but Peter. True self-discovery starts with God discovery. So you seek to know God, and in seeking after God, you find yourself. The next and greatest discovery after the discovery of God is the discovery of who you are in God. Paul prays that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened, that we might know the hope 
of our calling. What is the hope of your calling? The hope of your calling is what you are called to do. The hope of your calling is your ultimate destination. The hope of your calling is your purpose in life. Uh, the hope of your calling is who you are. It is your identity. It's your identity. It's who you are. This is key. This is the second foundation stone in the foundation of your life. And if this stone is shaken or out of place, then your foundation is compromised. And if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Who you are, your sense of identity is critical. Our sense of identity is at the core of our being. And because this is so important, this is why Satan always lodges his first attack on your sense of identity. The first attack that the enemy would lock, lodge against mankind was to question their identity when he asked Eve that, look, did God really say that? Are you really what God said you are? I don't think so. What you need to do is do this and then you will become what God is denying you from being. But that devil is a liar. Somebody shout, amen. Identity crisis. Of the many crises that exist in the, the world today, and I'm going to touch some sensitive things in a few moments, I would still argue that king amongst them is our identity crisis. The more I think about it, the more I study on it, the more I am convinced that the top crisis in the world today and at the root of so many ills in society is actually identity crisis. One would have thought that of the many advances in modern society, we would be wiser. But it would seem that the more we advance, the more we regress. One step forward, two steps backward. We read more but know less. We talk more but understand less. We chat more but connect less. We post more but host each other less. Uh, we are only a tweet away from our friends, yet no closer to one another. We watch more but see less. Our screen time is on the increase while our face time is on the decrease. We have more degrees than a thermometer, yet we are more confused than we ever were. Now we are even more confused than ever before as regards our identity. We don't know who we are or how to define ourselves with over 71 gender options, a multiplicity of sexual orientations, and a rainbow-colored spectrum between male and female and beyond. We are truly and surely confused. Fast becoming a, a, a pandemic in the day that we live in is the rise of depression. And this is, this, I, I'm not saying this lightly. There is no one size fits all when it comes to the issue of depression. There are so many the complicated mixes that lead to it. There's no one answer, save Jesus, but at the root of a lot of the depression in our world today is our confusion over who we really are. And the, 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 the challenge is that even the believer doesn't seem to be insulated from, the, from this because you find believer uh, tussled and confused. Am I sick or am I healed? Am I weak or am I strong? Am I confused or am I directed? Am I cast down or am I lifted up? Am I seated with Christ in heavenly places or am I below, down here on earth? So we even as believers still struggle with this. In the day that we live in today, we have elevated gender assignment and identif identification to be self-determined. Self-determined. I'm still talking about identity. <sighs> but if gender and identification is self-determined, what a confused world we live in. 
the question is, at what age can I self-determine my gender or my true identity? The world is pushing that age uh, of self-determination further and further down. So even though you won't let the child drive or take alcohol till 16, 18, uh, at single digit years, he can determine who he is above what his parents say. <laughs> From a faith perspective and a Bible perspective, the very philosophy of self-determination is actually elevating self above God. And if, in effect, it is making self God. Yet you did not birth yourself. You did not make yourself. Our God is known as the I am that I am. He is the I am God. And therefore, even when you say I am so, so, and so, even in your saying who you are, you have invoked God and are already admitting to the fact that you can't define yourself without God. However, in the beginning it was not so. Our identity and gender was not determined by us, it was determined outside of us by God. And so in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27, it lets us know. And God said, let us make man in our own image and let them have dominion. Male and female created he them. This was determined by God. This is what God said. Male and female created he them in the image and likeness of God. So the de definition of the identity came from outside us, not from inside us. We woke up to find out who we were. Like I've already alluded to, the first occurrence of identity crisis occurred in the Garden of Eden when Eve had a conversation with the serpent and he deceived her into buying, buying her own furniture because he caught, got, got her to doubt who she was because she did, wasn't established in the knowledge of who she was, telling her to disobey God and do something to become what she already was. She exploit, he exploited her personal identity crisis to deceive her and steal her identity. If you don't know who you are, you are vulnerable to all sorts of deception. You have got to know who you are. Whew. Now, before we vilify the whole identity debate, let's us consider what identity is. Identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. The characteristics that determine who or what a person or thing is. Serving to establish who the holder, owner, or wearer is by bearing their name. Oh, and often other details such as signature and photograph. I wish I had time. Synonyms for identity include individuality, what makes you separate, self, self, selfhood, personality, character, originality, distinctiveness, differentness, singularity, uniqueness, all right? Your identity is your means of identification, your means of differentiation. Identification is the action or process of identifying someone or something or the fact of being identified as different from another, a means of proving a person's identity, especially in the form of official papers. Synonyms for identification include recognition, singling out, pinpointing, naming, discerning, distinguishing, determination, establishment, ascertainment, discovery, <laughs> diagnosis, divination, verification, confirmation. What would the world be without identity? 
Without identity and identification, we would not be able to differentiate between things, between one thing and another thing. There would be chaos without identification. Identity is the premise for significance and relevance. Identification, identity is the premise for significance and relevance. Are you getting this? You can't be significant and relevant if you are not identified. So because I'm able to identify you, I can now um, see your significance or your relevance. Without a clear identity, I cannot be considered to be significant or relevant. Identity also serves as a point of reference and reference is only in relation to others. Listen, I cannot be number two if there wasn't at least a number one. So the very definition of me as number two is in relation to number one. And maybe in relation to number three if somebody comes after me. Are you hearing me what I'm saying? So it becomes a point of reference. So part of my identity comes from my relation, my relationships and also comparison with others. Identity also confers us with a sense of belonging. When I'm identified to belong to a certain group, then all of the attributes of that group are conferred upon me whether I personally have them or not. So Arsenal has been on the winning trail, and by God's will, continue to be on the winning trail going forward. <laughs> and so I say, we won last weekend. We beat so-and-so last weekend. We thrashed so-and-so the other weekend. And I didn't kick a ball. And I didn't travel to where the match was played. And I was not one of the 11 that was on the pitch. But yet I say we. Why? Because I identify with that group. And because I identify with that, and it's a good time to identify with that group, by the way. <laughs> because I identify with that group, I am now conferred with the rights of the group. Bragging rights. Because my group is winning. I draw a sense of significance and relevance by, by reason of belonging to this, that, or the other. Instinctively, we understand the importance of identity, so uh, we are often in pursuit of belonging to something or the other to acquire identity. Now, the first place that we draw identity from is actually from our home base, from our family, yeah? Uh, but when the family is dysfunctional, the potential for identity crisis is exponentially increased. But even in functional fam families, familiarity too often breeds contempt so that the teenager still looks for identity outside of his home. And we've all done it. I've been a teenager too. Still looking for something to belong to outside, to confer identity. But thank God, after some time, you realize that there's one thing that doesn't really change. It's my family. People come, people go. Friends come, friends go. My family remains the same. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with all of this. So how do you identify yourself? Who are you? Help me ask your neighbor, how do you identify who are you? How do you identify who are you? Who are you? Who are you? How do, I, do you identify yourself? How do you define yourself? Some people define themselves by what they do. So when you ask them who they are, I'm a doctor. I'm a preacher. I'm a project manager. I'm a business analyst. I'm this and that and the other. So they often define themselves by what they do, and I understand us, us doing that, and we will continue to do that. However, there's a problem when the entirety of your identity is rooted in your competence. Because the day that you are not com competent, you enter into a crisis. The day that you find yourself in a situation where, God forbid, you had an injury that doesn't allow you to perform the way that you used to perform, you enter into a crisis. This becomes a trigger for depression for a lot of people. You find somebody that was at the peak, peak of his profession, 
profession, the peak of his, uh, of his sport. Then he had a, a life-changing injury and could no longer do what he used to do before. And even though there are other options available to him, he goes through a long season of depression because his very self-definition -def came from his competence. Other people define themselves based upon what happened to them. What happened to you is not you. Oh, I need somebody to hear me this, this Sunday morning. I need you to resonate with somebody. That you went through it doesn't make you it. People talking about what happened to them 20, 30 years ago, like it was just yesterday. Your whole life has become defined by an occurrence. And I'm not belittling the occurrence. It was traumatic. It was bad. It was crazy. But it's still not you. People define themselves by what, they, what happened to them. Understandably, understandable way to define yourself, but not adequate. Other people de define themselves based upon their eth ethnicity. And it is from this whole idea of ethnicity that ro racial profiling comes into the picture. <laughs> because now you see somebody and simply by reason of their, uh, the way they look, you already categorize and conclude that this is how they are. That devil is a liar. In this so mixed up world, it is so ludicrous to simply define people by how they look. Oh, blacks are like this, whites are like that. Uh, black lady is talking, expressing her opinion, and she's the angry black lady. White lady is doing the exact same thing, and she's just expressing her opinion. She's just being passionate. You are being rude. What's up with that? Racial profiling. Black preacher, he's after my money. White preacher, oh, he loves people. How far? You define people based upon their ethnicity. Inadvertently, identity and identification lead to classification. Classification leads to putting people in boxes. Ah, uh, you knew me as Simon and put me in the Simon box. But I'm no longer Simon. I'm now Peter, but you are refusing to unbox me. I came to preach to somebody this Sunday morning. It's time for you to be unboxed. Come out of the Simon box and get into Peter even this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus, you have defined and identified yourself from the wrong premise. Who am I? How do I rightly define myself? Let's just say it as it is. The world can say whatever they want to say, but your natural human identity is determined by your paternity. Look, science bears it true. Look, I, I don't know, at one point in time, they, they elevated science above all and say science should trump everything else. Then they now get to another say and say that ignore the science and just say whatever you want to do. Okay, I, I'm self-determining myself as a Caucasian. <laughs> and you just have to accept me as that. That's who I am now. Hallelujah. I haven't gotten vaccinated, vaccinated but I self-determine as vaccinated. Come on, let's be real. The core of identity is by paternity. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? The absence of paternity is a serious thing because the child potentially grows with already a deficit in a sense of identity. But thank God we have a heavenly father who never leaves us nor forsakes us. Uh, when I talk about family, as I, I love my earthly family, I'm head of my own nuclear family, but I'm super elated that I'm a member of God's family. And God is my father. Uh, true fatherhood is about being a source and not just a source, but also a sustainer. Jesus is introduced to us by Isaiah as everlasting father. He is both source and sustainer to us. So Jesus defines me. 
I am not what you say I am. I am what Christ says that I am. Don't define me by what I have been through. I went through it, but it doesn't make me it. It's, there are a lot of people in the Bible that we have done injustice to. We keep on talking about the woman with the issue of blood. She no longer has an issue of blood. It's unfortunate that they didn't tell us what her name is, but for thousands of years, she's still the woman with the... She no longer... Had, she's healed. <laughs> Hallelujah. But people define you by your issue. Even when you're out of the issue, they're still talking about the issue. Hi. Jesus redefines us. That I failed doesn't make me a failure. That I messed up doesn't make me a mess up. It's just a temporary circumstance that's about to turn around for my good. If you believe it, come and shout amen. amen. My time is done. I'll pick up my thoughts next week, Sunday, when I'm unpacking and unlocking your potential. But let me quickly let you know that you are not Simon. You are Peter. That's what Jesus says. Even Simon Peter, and it's interesting that he's often called Simon Peter because when you look at Simon, um, Simon Peter's story, you find him still oscillating between the Simon in him and the Peter in him. You have a choice to make. Are you Simon or are you Peter? In your spirit, you are Peter, but in your flesh, you are Simon. Did you get that? In your spirit, you are Peter. In your flesh, you are Simon. Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we have chosen that we will serve the Lord. We are Peter. We are not Simon. Your mind is the arbiter between your spirit, Peter, and your flesh, Simon. What you are feeding your mind determines who's going to win between Peter and Simon. If you are constantly feeding your mind with the stimuli and the information from the flesh, your mind will side with Simon. But if you decide to constantly feed yourself with the revelation of the new you, your mind will side with Peter over Simon. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Choose the spirit over the flesh, faith over fear, grace over law, the righteousness of God over self-righteousness. Choose God-determination over self-determination. Choose Peter over Simon. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for the price that you have paid. We thank you for making a way for us. Hallelujah. Thank you because you are our definition. Thank you, Lord, because our identity comes from you. Hallelujah. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Amen and amen. I need to give an opportunity to anybody out there that has not surrendered their life to Christ Jesus and therefore has not taken on the new identity that is available to them. If you are ready to surrender your life to Christ Jesus this Sunday, please repeat these words of prayer after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the price that you paid for giving your life for me. Today, I repent of my sin and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I've believed with my heart. I've confessed with my mouth. By faith right now, I am born again. Amen and amen. If you pray that prayer, you are indeed born again. It's as simple as that. You now have the identity of Christ. Amen. For if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new.
creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. We want to help you to grow up in the Lord. So please contact us. Direct message us on any of our social media platforms. Visit our website. Follow the pathway that is there. Or contact us on the details that are on the screen now. And let's help you to grow in the Lord. It's imperative that you are planted in the house of God and growing from level to level and from height to height. So make sure that you do that. We are planted in the house of the Lord and we flourish in the courts in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Brethren, this week, work out confident in who you are. Don't let your situations tell you who you are. You tell your situation. Reintroduce yourself to that situation this week. I am a child of God. I'm a son of God. That bad money situation, reintroduce yourself to that situation. Say, no, 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 you don't, don't, you don't understand who I am. I'm a child of God and he supplies for all of my needs according to his riches in glory. That sickness situation, reintroduce yourself to that situation and tell him that I am the healed of the Lord for by the stripes of Jesus, I was, therefore I am healed. Walk with the confidence of knowing who you are. Hallelujah. Father, we give you the glory. We give you the praise.